This is One on One. Welcome to One on One. It is my pleasure to introduce for the first time with us uh, Mr. Tom Allen. He is the President and Chief Executive Officer of Summit Behavioral Health. How are you doing? Good, Steve. Thank you uh, very much for having me. I'm excited to be here. Well, it's good to have you. This is part of a series of programs we're doing trying to look at a whole range of issues, really doing with prescription drug abuse, which is in fact an epidemic, correct? It is. It is. I, I'd say it, it, it's been probably the last 10 years you've seen numbers spike. Uh, treatment for drug and alcohol, uh, opiate drug and alcohol addiction, um, or opiate prescription abuse has gone 300 per, up 300 percent in the last 10 years. And your organization is dedicated to? We're dedicated to uh, treating the individuals that are suffering uh, from the di disease of alcoholism or addiction. You know this personally, don't you? I do, I do. I'm a person in, in recovery, have been for a number of years now. Um, I was also uh, at, some, at one point addicted to prescription uh, pain medication. What makes you care so much about the people who suffer from these addictions to, to the point where you'd start an organization, build a business plan, go out and get the funding and do all the things it takes to be the CEO of an organization like this. Why'd you, why'd you do that? My, uh, I'm an activist at heart, I think, beyond anything else. And, uh, and a lawyer by training. A lawyer by training, <laughs> yes, yes. And um, figured there were enough attorneys out there and uh, not enough people that, that cared about stuff like this. So it, it is an issue that is, it has affected my family, uh, has affected uh, people that are near and dear to my heart, and it's affected me uh, uh, personally. Um, and it sort of lit a fire that uh, out of all that uh, negativity, out of all that um, destruction, that something positive could, could happen and, and uh, make some, some sort of change on a, on a macro level. What have you seen, Tom? My, uh, I got, I, I was telling you a little bit, I, I got into this uh, a few years ago. I moved back to New Jersey. I had started a program out in Arizona. I came back to New Jersey and I wasn't sure which direction I wanted to head in. And the idea of doing a, another startup was somewhat scary. Um, but I got involved with a couple organizations, uh, NCADD, New Jersey, NCADD New Jersey. Which stands for? National Council on Alcoholism and Drug Dependency. I, what uh, about our partner, Angela Valenti? The, the Partnership for Drug Free. Right. Uh, that, uh, there's a lot of good groups out there. and. and Angelo and the work that uh, his organization is doing is, is amazing from the prevention standpoint. And NCAT or NCADD was doing more from a policy standpoint. What was and, missing? Uh, not enough quality options in the state. I, I believe what does that mean? A, there's a big treatment gap in New Jersey. And when I say treatment gap, um, there's roughly 950,000 individuals. I'm coming at it from the treatment end. Uh, Angel Angelo's organization is looking at it from the prevention side. Uh, and I guess I'm sort of in that next component, which is the treatment of it. Um, we have roughly 970,000 individuals in the state of New Jersey that are suffering from uh, addiction or alcoholism. Uh, six in 10, one in nine New Jerseyans, uh, that roughly equates to six in 10 New Jerseyans know someone, whether it's a friend, coworker, or family member, that's suffering from uh, addiction. It affects everybody in one way or another. Where do they go? Well, that was, the, that was my impetus for this. I had gone to one too many funerals, uh, I believe it was eight over an 18-month period uh, for young adults ages 18 to 26. Um, a lot of these kids that, when I say kids, I mean young adult, a lot of these young adults that we were working with were, uh, if they were uh, insured, they were going uh, to the few options uh, in New Jersey that, that had available beds or accessibility. More often than not, they were getting sent to places such as Florida or Arizona or Pennsylvania, um, which made it difficult for the family to, to participate in the, the treatment process. Um, and I do believe this is an, Ill an illness that affects the family. Yeah, okay, so here's a couple things. A, why are we so far behind? And B, what's it feel like to be fighting this fight? First of all, how could we be this far behind when we know this problem exists, this epidemic? Couple things. I'm going to address it from the the treatment and, and development side. Uh, to get any residential treatment uh, program open in New Jersey, it's a it's a minor uh, minor miracle. So I, I live in a town of Montclair. Yep. And all of a sudden they say, you know what? We care about this problem, 
and we're going to house a residential treatment facility for people who are struggling with these addictions, right? Yep. Drug addiction? Yep. We're going to be in your neighborhood, Steve Adubato. What's going to happen? Not in my backyard. Uh, How I do would... you know that? I'm not saying specifically. Uh, I'm, I'm what happens specific... in most people's backyards? I've been involved with a number of zoning uh, uh, situations where we tried to, to open, um, and a lot of misinformation is out there about what drug and alcohol treatment is, what a addict looks like. An addict looks like me, looks like you, looks like the guy next door. But there's mis this misconception out there or this uh, stereotype that it's a, uh, a raving lunatic under a bridge and um, it's a normal person that, that uh, when I say normal, it's an everyday looking person. So when people say no, not in my backyard, what happens? We, uh, we've had, had the opportunity to go into several different communities to uh, present residential uh, options. And usually what happens is we present a plan to the zoning board and, and uh, land use laws are very uh, rigid in New Jersey. Um, because we're such a densely populated state, these land use laws are very rigid. So it's very hard to get a variance to, to operate a, a facility. Sure. And as soon as you release notice that you're, uh, or put notice out uh, that you're, you're gonna open a facility. Um, they the push back. Gets, yeah. The time is limited, so I wanna be clear here. When you can't house it there, when you can't put it there, either what, it doesn't happen or they go to another state? What happens? They go to another state. And so what happens to the people in New Jersey? They're stuck finding a, an option in Florida, finding an option in Pennsylvania, finding a limited option in New Jersey. Um, which is Devil's ideal. advocate, what's wrong with that? It's not including the family in the process. Why do you need the family? It's a family illness. In 56, alcohol was recognized as an illness. In 66, alcoholism was recognized as a disease. 74, addiction was rec recognized by a disease by the AMA. It's an illness, it's a disease, it's something, it's a family disease. If the family's in, not involved in the recovery process, the prognosis for recovery for the, the addict or their loved one is very slim. So therefore, where the patient is being treated matters greatly, depending upon whether the family is gonna be involved or not. Absolutely, absolutely. Our continuum right now, we're, uh, we're building a, uh, a number of uh, programs throughout the state. We've got a number of uh, outpatient centers already open. Um, but it was very important for us to, to strategically place these locations throughout the state that were accessible by New Jerseyans uh, without a, a long commute or a long distance so that the family could be involved in the, in the treatment process. It's co really complicated stuff, Tom. You gotta fight this fight every day. And um, the one message I took away from this, other than the fact that people will often say, we're all for you, but not in my backyard. The other one is, um, this is in fact a family disease. And throughout this segment, you saw a website, or a couple of websites, right? The Summit, um, Summit Behavioral uh, Health website, but also, uh, could you do the other one, Natalie, the other one for our partners at the uh, Angela Valenti's organization, the partnership, right? Do we have that one as well or no? Thank you very much. We'll put that up and it's important that people reach out because you cannot fight this one alone. Uh, Tom. Alan, who is the president and CEO of Summit Behavioral Health. I want to thank you for joining us. We appreciate it. Thank you very much for having me. You got it. Stay there. We'll be right back on One on One right after this. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by activists in cooperation with the American Medicine Chest Challenge, Choose New Jersey, NJIT. Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, the New Jersey Education Association, Berkeley College, and by the Healthcare Foundation of New Jersey. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. One-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato has been produced in partnership with St. Joseph's Healthcare System.